How did I come to write an article about fluoride in water or fluoridation? I was born curious. I took things apart to see what made them tick, whir, hum, and chime. I once made a broken down 1972 Pontiac Bonneville run like the wind with just a little bit of the right tinkering. In time, I went into dental surgery because I was fascinated, and I mean totally into it, fascinated by the amazing thing we call the human body. The other reason I became a dental surgeon was the fact that my brother-in-law was a general medical doctor and his lifestyle involved delivering babies at 3 in the morning. Personally, I like to be sleeping at 3 a.m. Let's talk about the curious issue of fluoride in water and governments making this fluoridation happen for better or for worse. I was academically raised on allopathic western medicine. Medication, surgery, and other intervention was the norm. But something in my curious mind told me not to fully drink the Kool-Aid, so to speak. I never took things at absolute face value. I questioned everything as potential dogma. I always wanted to check things out myself. Us docs are trained to be skeptical, but it came naturally for me. I love it when there are discrepancies so I can poke around a bit more. So I was looking for some interesting articles and came across the CDC website. That's the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The page that caught my eye was titled, Water-Related Diseases and Contaminants in Public Water Systems. Sounded interesting, as I'm always curious about water and health. Here's where it became intriguing to me. At the bottom of the article, there was a list with links to each item on the list. The list was called, Top 10 Causes Outbreaks in Public Water Systems. And the asterisk below highlighted the fact that it was, quote, based on tracking from waterborne outbreaks from 1971 to 2008, only confirmed causes have been included in the analysis." End of quote. Well, the list included eight infectious microorganisms and two elements, copper and excess fluoride. I wondered why it didn't say excess copper. I just had to click on the excess fluoride link. I mentally made a note that for water outbreaks, it said excess fluoride, and so should you. The link led me to another CDC page called Water Fluoridation. It pointed out that fluoride is the 13th most abundant element in the Earth's crust and present in virtually all waters. It's also in almost every food you eat, but can be especially high in beer and wine. Well, when my patients learned that, they used to ask me if they could go down to the bar to get their fluoride treatment. <laughs> Great senses of humor. But even more fascinating to me was that this link from the Outbreaks page said that, quote, Fluoridation, the process of adding fluoride to the public water supply, has been responsible for a remarkable reduction in cavities and tooth loss and was named by CDC as one of 10 great public health achievements of the 20th century." End of quote. So is water fluoridation a bad thing, like on the outbreaks page, or a good thing, as one of the 10 great public health achievements of the 20th century as shown on another page of the same CDC site? Let me add another quote and we'll see. Quote, all things are poison and nothing is without poison, only the dose permits something not to be poisonous, end of quote. That was quoted by Paracelsus. He was the founder of the discipline of toxicology. It means that substances that are considered toxic, like fluoride, are harmless in small doses. And on the other hand, a normally harmless or even healthful substance, such as water, can be deadly if overconsumed. A 28-year-old mother of three named Jennifer Strange found that out the hard way when she died just hours after participating in a radio contest to see who could drink the most water without going to the bathroom. In that case, and because of dosage alone, water was the poison. The CDC article went on to say that, quote, the U.S. Public Health Service recommends a concentration of 0.7 to 1.2 milligrams per liter, or parts per million, end of quote. That was the ideal dosage I learned when I was in school. The CDC says that 72.4% of the U.S. population uses fluoridated water. So is the dosage high enough for benefit and low enough to avoid being a poison? Remember, it's dosage that makes it one or the other. To be candid, I'm not sure myself for the correct answer to the question I just posed. In my reading of over 100 research articles on fluoridation, both the pros and the cons, which is the only way to rationally get to the bottom of things, there are certainly vocal proponents and opponents which seem to just confuse the rest of us. The opponents can make it sound like the sky is falling when it comes to the water fluoridation issue. I'm not buying that argument at this stage, but in all my studies, I never was fully convinced that water was the best means of delivering the good part of fluoride that would help our dental health. 
So when push came to shove, my true belief had to come out. I have four children, and in their early years, we lived in a town in Australia that did not have fluoride in water. Because of my skeptical nature about the benefits of water fluoridation, I did not give my kids vitamins with fluoride or supplement them in any way with fluoride. However, and this is important to know, but it's too long to explain why in this article, fluoride does seem to have extremely good benefits when applied directly to the teeth in very low doses, non-poisonous. The rate of tooth decay didn't improve nearly as drastically with the fluoridation of water as it did with the fluoridation of toothpaste. Put it on, brush around, and spit it out. Minimal ingestion with maximum benefit. And I realize there will be those out there who will continue to think that any dose of fluoride is a toxic poison and will avoid fluoride toothpaste at all costs too. Just for fun, consider the dose the USPHS recommends of 0.7 to 1.2 parts per million for drinking water. Now consider that red wine has 1.05 parts per million and white wine has 2.02 parts per million fluoride, almost double the amount in fluoridated water. For goodness sake, raisins have 2.34 parts per million fluoride. Tea has over 3 parts per million. You can't get away from ingesting fluoride. It's everywhere. So I plead for perspective in this debate over fluoride in water. But I want to add one more thing for those of you who would like to minimize it from your drinking water, since 72% of us in the U.S. have fluoridated tap water. We talk a lot about life support water being the optimal water to ingest to give you an optimal pH, electrical charge of excess electrons to donate, and an ease of flowing through aquaporins of your cell walls to hydrate amazingly quickly. Make sure you see our article on aquaporins. Here's one more reason to get a top quality life support water generating machine. Optimal water is created by the process of splitting the H2O molecule using very high electrical charges. Two different streams of water come out of the machine, electrically pulled either toward the positively charged electrode or the negatively charged one. The water we want to drink is created at the negatively charged electrode inside the machine. The minerals we want to ingest into our bodies are positively charged, calcium, sodium, magnesium, etc., and are attracted to this negatively charged electrode and into the life support water we drink. The positively charged electrode attracts negatively charged ions within the water that most people don't want to drink. These include chlorine, fluoride, bromine, etc. Most people just flush this stream of water down the sink. If you want to minimize fluoride from your water, I can think of nothing better than a device that will electrically sort positive from negative ions and flush away the negative ions, such as fluoride. If you'd like to learn more, join us for one of our water education webinars.